back to The Late Show. Ladies and gentlemen, my first guest tonight spent 21 years in the military and served as the 27th Secretary of Defense. He's now written a memoir called A Sacred Oath. Please welcome to The Late Show, Secretary Mark Esper. Well, I knew Secretary, th thanks for coming on. I was supposed to have you on uh, last week when I got my second bout of COVID. Thanks for, for boomerang. Yeah, you're a super spreader, aren't you? I am. I am. I am. Now, uh, the new book is called uh, A Sacred Oath. I want to get into what that actual sacred oath right. is in, in just a bit. But first, I want to ask you about the former president uh, who you served under. He often said that he knew more about the military than any of the generals, maybe more than anybody of all time. As a uh, Secretary of Defense and a West Point graduate, what was your assessment of the former president's military knowledge? Uh, I thought you were going to ask hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer would be no. Mm -hmm. because he does not know more than the generals and admirals. Does he know more no, than, no, say, do most an average person on the street? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. I don't, you served under this, him. You don't. At this think... point, he probably does. Okay. Oh, because because he's he got, served four he years in office. Secret right. stuff like that. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Um, there are many examples in the book here of the president demanding loyalty uh, to himself as opposed to the Constitution. Right. Uh, same sort of thing that Jim, Jim Comey talks about mm -hmm. in his book. Um, people fear that he might use the military as a, as a, as a distraction um, or even to use the military to intervene with the election. Mm -hmm. Were those fears grounded? Did you... Did you share those fears? I, I had concerns, certainly beginning in the summer of 2020, after June 1st, that at some point there may be that inclination to use the military to seize ballot boxes, to... Uh... But I will stop you there. You said, you know, that inclination, as if that inclination would occur to anybody. <laughs> it's a dire and traitorous inclination, isn't it? Yeah, no, it would be, it would be violating one sacred oath to the Constitution, the one that all elected officials take. It would be... Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Okay. And so... What did you do in response to that perceived threat? Well, you know, I, I, what I tried to be is to is remain in the position to be a circuit breaker in case, you know, ideas with regard to employing the military against other countries or in the case of domestic disturbance, deploying troops to Seattle or Portland, which became, which began the push, became the push in, in uh, July and August of that month. But then as we got closer in the final days leading up to the election, I think it was the last Friday in October, I had to call uh, my head of the National Guard in and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and have this private discussion and say, listen, in the days uh, on election day or the days following, if you get any type of call from the White House, notify me immediately so I can intercede if that's what it took to, uh, to prevent anything bad from happening, if you will. So you would say, we're not going to send troops in to seize the ballots? No. Uh, with a, well, I mean, the president yeah. might have ordered that. that we, we, we learned from your book that that was a consideration. Right, so, and, and that's why the position of Secretary of Defense is so important, because the only two people in the United States that can deploy troops are the President and the Secretary of Defense. So it was critical for me to be in that position to be the circuit breaker in case somebody wanted to do something, whether it was deploy troops to suppress protesters or deploy troops to, you know, to grab a ballot box, whatever the case may be. And of course, we learned in December, I'm out of office now over a month, that people would come to the White House and propose this in, in late December, of 2020, and this eventually becomes the reason why myself and nine other former secretaries of defense write this note on, Jan on January 3rd, 2021, warning the Pentagon to follow your oath, uh, do not get involved in the election. So why are you gone at that point? Why are you, do you resign or are you fired? I got fired November 9th. Um, I was told through his- What did his... you do? <laughs> He's a reasonable guy, uh, what did you do? I, I followed my oath. Okay, uh, okay. So, I, yeah, I get the call from Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, around 10 to 1. He says, look, uh, you're being replaced. Uh, you, uh, you haven't been sufficiently loyal. And Again, I, to the president. To the president, the right. And, yes. and, I, and I respond, uh, that's his prerogative, but my oath is to the Constitution, not to him. So... It's a, weird, it's a weird position to be in, and, and, and I want to get to in just a little while, and people have criticized you for not telling us this before, right. and I've heard some of your answers on sure. that, and I, I understand some of the rationale, but before we get to that, I want to 
ask what it is like for you as a, as, a, as a military man, as a West Point graduate. Is there a class they teach at West Point on how to protect the country from the commander in chief? <laughs> and if not, and I mean this seriously, yeah. do you think there should be a class from this moment forward? You know, I, I took my first oath as I described in a book on, uh, in July 1982 when I became a cadet at West Point, right? My first of a dozen oaths. And during my time in service, I served on active duty for 10 years and war and all that. You know, I never really had to consider the oath and what it means. And I never had to consider really deeply duty, honor, country, which, are the, which is the motto of the academy. And it wasn't until this job where I reached the point that day in and day out, I'm asking myself, what, what is my duty? What, what's my oath? What's, what does it mean to put the country first? And the conundrum here is that if you, when you swear that oath to the Constitution, the Constitution also says, by the way, there's this thing called Article II, which means there is a commander in chief, and you have to obey his lawful orders. And fortunately, President Trump rarely gave orders. And so. What do you mean he rarely, rarely he, he gave orders? He rarely gave direct orders. What would he do? How would you know what he, he was supposed suggests, to do? He suggests, he muses, he rants, and hopes people will pick up on it and run with it. Kind of like a mafia don going, I'd hate to see something terrible happen to that guy. <laughs> that, that, that kind of thing? Like a suggestion? Will no one rid me of this meddlesome monk kind of behavior? And, and that, I describe that. that for, so fortunately, it gives somebody like me the chance to really think about my oath and what's the right thing for the country. Because as I say, your oath isn't to the president. It's not to a party. It's not to a philosophy. It's to the Constitution and, by extension, the American people. We have to take a quick break. Uh, but when we come back, I will ask the former secretary why he felt he couldn't tell us what was going on inside the White House. Stick around.